Uh, cool. So, hello, I'm Simon. I'm here uh, from bunny.net. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about doing some cool things with a workstation uh, to better secure your environment that you're going to work from. And um, we're going to go through the agenda quickly. Um, introductions to me, to the bunny. Uh, requirements, what we've defined for this particular scope of project. We're going to go through Heads firmware, talk a bit about the Intel management engine, talk about a recent port I did to bring uh, a desktop board into the Heads firmware project. I'm going to talk about physical security of the machine so that you're in a, a known good state. Uh, then we're going to talk about Cubes OS and then talk a little bit about uh, some opportunities at Bunny. So. I'm a VP at Bunny, as I said. I've been working here for about a year. Uh, before that, I was with Akamai for 10 years. I've been working for about 30 years in the industry, so that makes me probably the oldest person in the building by now. Um, I actually saw some really cool stuff in the glass cabinets out in the library, which were, to me, stuff I used as a kid, um, which are now museum pieces, which is nice to see. Um, so yeah, it's good to see the next generation out here, and uh, you're all interested in uh, security, which is really good. So I love reverse engineering. Um, I love RF. I love taking things apart, putting things back together, making them work better. Um, I've been part of the Cubes OS team for quite some time. Same with Heads. I've been contributing there for a while. Uh, I have many boxes of wires. Um, if anyone has not got many boxes of wires, please make sure you do. They're very important. Uh, Bunny.net is an EU-based, privacy-respecting, GDPR-compliant CDN. That's a content distribution or content delivery network. Uh, we do storage and cloud service provider. We are actually the fastest CDN in the world as of this year, and that's from independent rankings from CDN Perf using their own real user metrics. So that's monitoring with JavaScript in, uh, on real users' uh, browsers to see how long responses and requests take. We power over a million websites. Uh, the capacity of the network is 81 terabits a second currently at 114 pops globally. And you can see there's a cool little infographic that shows you all of the big names, and they're all slower than us. So awesome. And uh, they're all more expensive as well. Fantastic. So what are we doing with the hardened workstation? So we want to be able to ensure that we can audit and verify the code that runs on your, f on your hardware from the moment you turn power on. The first instruction that hits the CPU, you want to own that. Once you do that, you're moving the root of trust into something you know. And you're going to do that with entirely uh, open source code, no closed source blobs, no, no dumps from uh, Intel or anything like that. We're going to maintain firmware integrity. We want to do that to make sure that you know, nothing's changed in that when we know it's in a known good state. Uh, we want to make sure the operating system is maintained in a known good state. But all of the security features, we want to make sure that they uh, keep people out and make sure our environment is secure, but also without impeding us. Because you know, th th there's often a trade-off. More security can mean more problems in having to do things and going around all of these different gardens to, to get it done. So hopefully with this, we try and avoid that. Um, also, cool thing, we want to be able to run multiple operating systems at the same time on the same desktop seamlessly and just switch between them all and just by moving the mouse. Um, and we want it to be uh, an efficient and useful research tool. So let's talk a bit about firmware. So firmware replaces the vendor black box firmware. This is Heads. Uh, it's built using Core Boots, which I'm sure most of you are aware of, and Linux. It's used on Chromebooks, so Google used this. Purism, if you've heard of the Librem series of privacy laptops, they use this. Uh, in Sergo, Privacy Beast Machines use this, and also Nitro Key, if you've heard of those guys. So it's open source, transparable, transparent, and auditable, and it's reproducible. So what's reproducible? So this is where you can download a firmware ROM from a website like Heads uh, Conditional, uh, sorry, Circle CI build system, and you can verify the hash of that. And then you can go and build that code yourself into your own binary, and the hash will match. So everything should match. You can know that this code and that build is using this code that you've looked at. So reproducible bit, uh, builds are really important when you want to be uh, transparent. So what does it do? Well, it handles all the hardware initialization. And when it starts setting up all of the bits of the CPU, training the RAM and all that stuff, it measures all of the values of that into PCRs in the, in the trusted platform module, or TPM. And what that is, is it's just measuring your system and making a hash of each part of the system so you know nothing has changed. Once it's done all that, those hashes are then compared and you use an external token for uh, HOTP access, which sits in your USB port, and it flashes green 
if your firmware hasn't changed. If it flashes red, your firmware has changed. Bad things have happened. Um, you can also use an authenticator app, so Google Auth, Duo, whatever, uh, on your phone. And that will print out, you know, you're familiar with a six-digit code. Do the same thing. It'll just have a code that matches. You can see that on the black box there on the left. There's the TOTP code and the uh, HOTP success status. So you've got two external machines or factors that are validating your firmware hasn't changed. So why do this? Well, it prevents things like firmware rootkits, persistence in your firmware, modifications to your firmware. You know that the firmware you have installed in your machine is the firmware that's running. Um, so how does the, what's the vendor blob situation? Basically, on old Ivy Bridge and Sandy Bridge hardware, you don't have to use any vendor blobs at all with this solution. It's completely open source. Um, we also neutered, disable, and shrink the Intel management engine. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, on AMD uh, FAM15H chips, you can also do completely blob-free. So that's like the KGP16, I think it's called. Uh, there's also Power9 open architecture. This is where even the silicon is open source. So you can look at the silicon die plans and everything and get down into the whole nitty-gritty. Now, a lot of this sort of threat model is designed against hackers with a lot of capability. So your Dean obviously said earlier in the welcome introduction about hackers who've got a lot of money. There was an sort of allusion to who that might have been. I think we all know. Um, these kind of targets, when you're the defender against those kind of adversaries, then they're going to be able to use everything in their arsenal to get into your system and watch what you're doing. They want to be able to see what you're doing. Is You're the countermeasures to them. So it's their, in their interest to make sure they're seeing what you're doing. And protecting your firmware from the top down and knowing that nothing has changed gets around that persistence. So I'm just going to skip this one. Let's show you uh, once it's done this verification that I was talking about. What it then goes on to do is verify the, firm, the operating system. So when you're putting all of this open source firmware in and you've baked it in and you've set it up with the TPM and it's all signed and attested, what you can also do is it bakes in a GPG public key as part of that. And you have a token which sits in your hand, the same one that flashes the light to say it's a tested OK. Um, and that will sit, and it will also tell you, using that GPG key, that you have signed all of the files in the boot partition. So you make a hash of your kernel, your initial RAM disk, your system map, your grub config, stuff like that. And then you use this token to sign it and say, yes, this change is valid. And you do that every time you install or update your operating system, change your kernel, stuff like that. Um, and then heads will go through the boot process, attest to you on the firmware, then attest to you that your operating system hasn't changed. So you're talking about a root of trust that is literally from the first instruction in your CPU all the way at this point down into your operating system. So what are some drawbacks to heads? Well, it can take a little while to post. When you turn it on, it has to do all these measurements of your machine state and validate those. So it can take a little bit longer. Um, there is some limited vent, uh, support. So there's only a handful of machines you can use this on. Um, although, you know, help porting is always welcome. Um, there are mainly older generation Intel CPUs that this works on because of the need for vendor free, blob free. Um, but welcome anyone who's uh, able to help with that. I recently ported a new mainboard into the project. So instead of looking like the picture you see on the screen there, flashing something, all you've got to do is take a ROM chip out, put it in your programmer, and put it back in. No wiring, no clips, no nothing, which is really cool. Uh, upcoming stuff, we're going to make a NixOS uh, pure build environment. Uh, there's Haswell Family CPU native RAM in it coming soon, which is nice, and some write protection changes. If you really want a deep dive, then one of the guys who is one of the the, the core maintainers of this project, uh, Tilorian, or uh, he runs in Sergo, has wrote uh, a really good uh, uh, talk, which he did at FOSDEM. And the link's there. I'm sure the slides will be shared around later. You can grab them. What does it actually look like? For some reason, the video is not showing. <laughs> That's amazing. Let me see if I can get this up from somewhere. The video is there, but it's no longer playing. Fantastic. That's amazing. Let me see if I can find it. I think it might be this one. 
OK, cool. So this is me powering on my machine. As I said, it takes a little bit of time for all of the registers to be measured, everything to happen. When that starts happening, Core Boot's initted all the hardware. What you'll see is then the Linux kernel booting, and that's, that's head's payload. There it goes there. And currently, you'll see on the hardware plugged in at the top, there's a green light flashing. That means the Nitro key or Librem key has said, yes, your firmware is valid. There's my phone showing the same code, which is on the screen. As you can see, the TOTP code there. And what that's told me is my firmware hasn't changed, my public key hasn't changed, everything in the machine that I know of as installed has not changed. And I'm sure of that now. So I will then go ahead and I'll boot my operating system. I want to know if the operating system's changed. And that's what you see down here at the bottom. You can see the key used in the, uh, in the hardware token. Uh, there's generated the public key from the uh, uh, ROM matches the one that's set by the hardware token. That's signed the kernel, and there's the kernel boot line. And that'll then boot the system. Let me pull this back. So before I talk about ME, um, th that is basically how you secure your firmware you know, from the first CPU instruction with open source. It's really cool. So next elephant in the room is the Intel management engine. What is it? Um, a lot of people call this ring minus three. It's not really because it is effectively a computer in itself sitting on the CPU die of your Intel chip. And it has lines into all of your memory or everything. It can see everything, basically. Um, it's basically, it can own your system in a heartbeat. And that's just the way it's built. It's there. You can't turn it off. Anyone who has access to the management engine in your machine can own your machine. We don't know who has access to it. We don't know if any of that's illegal or legal. We don't know if that's forced by government um, court orders or anything like that. There's just no one knows. It's there, though. So what do we do with it? We have figured out some ways to neuter it. Um, if you don't neuter it and you just delete the firmware, what happens is your machine will just keep rooting, rebooting every 30 minutes in a cycle. It'll just switch, shut off and reboot, which is useless. So. It's a very deep rabbit hole if you want to go down and look into this more. Um, no, no pun intended. But uh, I'm probably not going to talk too much about that. But let's talk about how to get rid of it. So the first shout out I'm going to give to the NSA. So thanks, guys. They were the ones who helped the industry figure out how to turn off management engine. Um, because they built in as a requirement when they told Intel, you're making these chips, great. They've got this management engine on there, great. We want you to put in a switch so that we can turn it off, because we don't like what it does, which is kind of cool. So we know where that switch is. It's in the Intel firmware descriptor, if you're interested. Um, and it's just a bit. You just flip it on or off. And uh, we turn that off as part of the heads build. What was also discovered earlier on in the uh, research into this uh, management engine was that the re in some chipsets, particularly Ivy Bridge, when the CPU is booting and that timer is going, the timer will stop as long as it sees ME is doing something. It doesn't care what it's doing. So what we do is we keep it in a bring up state. So basically, you remove everything except the first bit that helps it boot, and then you just keep it in that state in a loop. It's called the BUP phase, or BUP. And the reboot timer stops. There's a Nicola Corner wrote a utility, which some of you may have heard of, called ME Cleaner. It's available on GitHub. And it, that basically strips all of the firmware out and just leaves that bit at the top that helps it come up. And it just keeps it in that state. Um, what we then do is all of that free space that's left by the management engine in the ROM, we take that over into heads, and that whole bit becomes part of the measurement. So that 4 meg of Intel management firmware goes down to 98k of useless nothing, and then the rest of it's taken up with heads. So in any way that... Um, 98k gets changed or overwritten, suddenly your head's firmware has changed. It's no longer going to attest. You're going to get a red light when you boot. Your system's not going to boot. It's going to tell you, hey, I'm broken. So um, it's, 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 we can't know 100% for sure that nothing is capable in the management engine um, in this state, but we can be reasonably sure what it does at this point. I also introduced the optional use of uh, the VSCC table deletion into heads recently. So there's a portion of the firmware descriptor which contains a map of all of the different 
chip identifiers, ROM chip identifiers, and ways to write to them and from them. Um, and I figured out that if you remove this section, that um, it doesn't impede the system at all, but according to the Intel documentation, what it actually does is stops the management engine knowing how to talk to the ROM. So basically, you take away its ability, ability to write back any, any information. So we've got the NSA bit set to stop it working. We've got it forced into a bring up state, looping forever in there. Um, we've removed it, all of its um, firmware down to nothing but the bring up state and also taken away its ability to write to the ROM chips. So effectively, it's gone. Um, now, one of the things that I talked about earlier was there's a very limited support on um, heads firmware, what machines it can do. It's mainly designed for Lenovo laptops, some Asus machines, a couple of servers. Um, there wasn't really a, a viable desktop solution that you could put decent RAM in, that you could have PCI expansion buses on and stuff like that. So I ported this board in recently, and that's now in the master uh, of the project. Um, but the point, one of the big points was it's easy to do. You can just pull the ROM chip out and put in a flasher like a you know, CH341 or whatever, and then uh, write your ROM to it and take it out, and there you go. So what about physical security? Well, we've got the machine now. We know the firmware is good. We know it's uh, all, all set up right how we want it. Or well, what about if someone comes into our house and opens the case and changes something? So could someone tamper in the case? Could they tamper with the SSD? Could they tamper with the TPM module? Could they tamper with the ROM? Solution one, sparkly glitter glue. Not only does it provide a one-time unique seal that will never be replicated, ever, you can see there, you're not going to be able to reproduce those patterns of glitter ever. Um, but it also makes it nice and sparkly, which is kind of cool. On the front, rear, and SSD, I use uh, security steels. These are numbered, uniquely numbered with long numbers. And when you peel them off, they're those ones that come apart and say void. So you know that your case hasn't been opened. Uh, you have a visual identifier. So at this point, after your installation, you've got a very, very secure system that you know all the instructions are running on the firmware you know, and your machine has not been opened up. So we have a tamper-proof machi machine in a good state. What do we put on it? Cubes. So Cubes US is um, targeted at journalists, activists, whistleblowers, and security researchers. But one of the big things about Cubes US is people make mistakes. We are the weak link in the chain. We always have been, we always will be. People click on links, accidentally or you know, because they're tricked to. People download a payload to inspect it, and it does something un unexpected. This is, you know, just part and parcel of what we do. So Cubes pr helps prevent that mistake. It lets you make them and not worry about it. It's no big deal. We'll talk about how that happens in a minute. Um, obviously, it has full disk encryption as well, so, you know, anyone gets hold of your drive, need the key. So what is it? Open source. It's based on Zen. So if any of you know what, I'm sure you probably all know what that is. Um, but what it does, it takes all of the Zen, op, uh, Zen machines and puts them together in one seamless desktop. So they're all running under the hood, but in, for, in, in front of you, they're all in one place. But not only is it just virtual machines on one screen, each cube has purpose. So you can say, this is my firewall, this is my... NetVPN, this is my um, one that I contact my bank in, this is my vault where I keep my secrets. And some of those are air gaps, some of those are not. It's up to you how you set it up. Um, these are, you know, they have natures. They can be full on, full installation machines, they can be stripped down machines, and they have levels of trust. So you can trust them completely, like your vault, or you can trust them not at all, like disposable machines, where you're about to click a, a link to go, what does this link do? Um, it looks suspect. Let's figure it out. So you can do that research where if you open up a disposal VM, you can go and click on you, something you know is a phishing link just to see what it does. And you can be comfortable when you click X and that machine shuts down. It's not going to affect your system. And it does that through isolation so uh, and, and templates and, uh, and multiple operating systems. So your templates, think of your templates as uh, an air-gapped copy of the machine. That's where your install lives, but you never use it. It just sits there. When you start up a new machine, let's say a uh, disposable VM or something like that, what you're doing is you're taking the template, 
copying it, not co you use them, just referring to it, and making a new machine over here. The template's air gapped, template's not touched. This machine cannot affect this template whatsoever. But you're going to run this machine, and that's where you're going to do your stuff in. And then when you finish with it, and you click X, it's all disappeared, it's gone, it's finished with. <laughs> Uh, we also use different cubes to do different, different things, so things like isolation and networking. So let's say you have another cube over here that's based on your Debian template, and that cube, just its one purpose is to talk to your network hardware. So you set up a PCI mapping that maps your network hardware to that cube, and that cube, all it does is suddenly it's got a PCI device that's your network. It then handles incoming connections from your firewall cube and just routes them to the network. Um, You've then got a situation where this, this continued isolation. We'll have a look at some network examples in a minute. It looks like this. That really looks complex, but it's simple to grasp once you start using it. Different levels of trust have different color codes. So for example, if you look at the, uh, the top there, you can see the red disposable VM running uh, Hunix and Tor. Uh, is talking to a Tor, uh, Tor bridge or Tor, Tor uh, entry node, which then talks to your firewall, which then talks to your network, which then talking to your net, uh, actual physical network device. And it looks quite complex, all that, but we'll, we'll, we'll bring it down into something quite easy here. So let's look at this one and go, right, here's a good example. So you've got your Tor browser or your disposable virtual machines, and they connect to Tor through a cube called SysHunix. That runs on its own up there. Now that would then, let's say you want to connect to Tor over a VPN, that could then talk to a SysVPN, and then you, that VPN will talk to your firewall, which will talk to your Ethernet. Down at the bottom, you've got your trusted systems. This is like, you know, you, you're happy to use your browser here to do your banking, talk to your personal email, stuff like that. You don't need to go through all of the complexity of that. You can just go straight to your firewall. So all this is it's a bit like software-defined networking, but it's just point and click. It's just selectable. You can select which one goes where. And you can chain these like you see in the diagram. Now, the sys cubes can also be made sort of immutable based off templates. It's called disposable in the cubes world. So you get rid of it by um, when you close it. When it closes down, it's back to a known good state. So let's say something happens. Your machine gets infected. This um, virtual machine, sorry, gets infected. When you click X, it's gone. You're back to a known good state. So let's look at a cool example. This is something I use this quite a lot for, is having a machine that you can use a one-stop um, pen test bridge. So this is a security research lab in a box example, basically. So you'd have, um, you can run Windows, uh, and then you've got, say, your Linux pen test target, your Metasploitable machine running in different cubes up there in the, in the red untrusted zone. You connect them to a sys bridge, which you connect Kali to. And then you've got a way to run penetration testing against those particular machines from your Kali instance. It's as if they're just remote network machines. Uh, you can make it so they're on the same network segment. You could make it so that they're remote. You can, you can configure this any way you want. Um, you could also give your test targets internet access if you wanted to. For example, if you wanted to test from them things like uh, user interaction requirements where they've got to clip out to uh, links. For example, if you want to test phishing, things like that, you could do it that way. And this is actually what it looks like. On that screen there, you can see my Cube's desktop the other day. On, you've got Recon NG running in a Kali Cube. You've got Metasploit uh, running Nmap in another Kali cube. You've got uh, a Hunix browser cube that's at the top left. So that's running a, um, a Hunix browser with the Anon distribution, which is going out over Tor using the Onion site, as you can see from the UL. Well, maybe you can't, it's a bit small. Um, you've then got Windows 10 in the bottom left hand corner. Paint's open because, you know, who doesn't like to paint? Uh, you then got a disposable VM here in the red screen uh, with all the black background and white text. Um, and below that, you've got a trusted VM. You can't see it, but it actually it's a super secret file um, because that's an air-gapped vault. And again, they're all color-coded. If you look at the colors, red for danger, 
Yellow for trusted, but not fully trusted. Black is absolutely trusted. And there's nothing green on there because I wasn't doing anything with my personal stuff at the time. But they've all got visual trust levels that you can see immediately and know what you're working in. Um, there's some links on the slides. As I said, we're going to share them around later. Um, but some cool ideas run Metasploitable in a cube. Uh, you can do organizational security audits. Now, this is actually going to be something really interesting. You might want to look at the link on here. There's one of my fellow uh, colleagues from the Cubes OS project um, called Diplo. He's another admin there. Uh, he wrote a really, really, really good talk and presentation on using cubes for organizational security. Anyone who's going into that area, I suggest you, you, you take a look at that, uh, that link on the forum. It's really a well-written uh, presentation. Uh, there's also another one there for SecLab in a box, which is kind of similar to some of the stuff I've talked about, where you can um, have different machines running, uh, targeting uh, different other machines for pen testing and things, but just way more advanced. There's another link there for that, um, uh, and worth visiting and having a read. So who's endorsed this, this setup? Well, Let's Encrypt, they love it. Uh, the obligatory Edward Snowden comment is there. Um, Mulvad, they're also um, very keen on our stuff. Mulvad used this for all of their workstations. This is not just something they go, yeah, it's great. They actually use this day to day. Um, and, uh, and there's other people like um, uh, the director of InfoSec at The Intercept. Uh, there's a long list of people who recommend Cubes OS. I don't know, do you want to just put your hand up if you've heard of Cubes OS before today? Two, three. Oh, guy, how many of you have actually used it? Yeah, one and a half. <laughs> okay, um, I suggest just giving it a try and seeing what you think of it. It might seem daunting at first, but it's actually really easy to get to use. And once you feel the power of it and you understand what you can do with it and what it can offer you, um, it's actually uh, it, it, it's 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 pretty good to realize. Pardon? Performance is pretty good, same as running a virtual machines. The only thing that downside in my own view of cubes is there's, there's, for security reasons, is there's no GPU access for displays. You only use the internal GPU. So don't think of this as a system you're going to run games on. It's not designed for that. But what you can do is put a GPU in there, bridge that GPU to a cube over a PCI device, and then use that as a number cruncher, for example, for Hashcat, which is really useful. I use the 6800 XT. Really nice. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is pretty much getting to the end now. So just some fun, fun memes. Cubes OS adoption, as we just saw, one of you put your hand up to actually using it. So there you go. Out of 100, there's the one. But fortunately, you're mighty. <laughs> But if you should, you know, if you're not using it, as I said, give it a try because you should be, especially if you're going to be looking into, you know, going up against some really uh, serious adversaries in the future. So if you want to get involved, um, first of all, that the obligatory shameless plug, we are running a new CloudSec intern program at Bunny. Net. So if any of you are interested in applying for our internship and getting real world experience, working on a homegrown Slovenian homegrown cloud platform, um, you know, come and talk to us outside. If anyone who's also already got industry experience, we're also recruiting. Um, if you want to get involved with the Cubes OS project or the Cubes OS community, the URLs are there. And also Heads Firmware, the URLs are there. I put Core Boot at the bottom because that's kind of part of that's how Heads works. It uses that as well. But uh, it's, it's also worth checking out. Corbett's supported on a lot more boards. If you don't feel you need the security of a, an, in, uh, an attested ROM uh, using heads, then Coreboot is supported on a lot more platforms. At least you've then got an open source firm where you can run yourself and be, secu you know, be, be quite sure of what's running on your, on your machine. OK, that's it from me. Thank you very much. And uh, have a great day. Bye for now.